time and then it's great. Um, okay, so uh, for the next um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the research program we've been doing. So we have done to have you by the Paredes over the last It's working, great. Thank you very much. So, well, um, that we've been working on for the last well, four years or whatever. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, on and off, more or less. And it's about, so if you, as he Hartmut likes to phrase it, it's about putting the star back into star formation. Um, meaning, as we'll see, Stars are pretty much the only reliable clocks we have in this whole star formation business. Um, because molecular clouds, time scales are a bit an issue, chemical time scales depend on assumption of the geometry, etc. etc. So and if you look at the stellar ages in molecular clouds, um, you come to a few surprising, maybe surprising, maybe not, conclusions. And so that's what this whole thing is about, and then essentially what what the consequences are of realizing that um, that age spreads have a certain distribution and so on. Okay, so here's the old problem, of course, uh, the classical star formation problem, as we heard already yesterday uh, in the January. If all the branch gas in the galaxy collapsed in its freefall time, then the star observed star formation rate would be pick a number, 20 times, 100 times, uh, 30 times higher than observed. Yeah? And this is, of course, a very naive argument. The argument is just, you take all the molecular gas, you assume a mean freefall time, you divide that amount of molecular gas by that freefall time, and you get a star formation rate mass over time scale. And then you compare that to the observations, and lo and behold, you get this time. Okay. And then people say, okay, so the traditional solution is, okay, um, if you want to make something inefficient or slow, you support the molecular clouds against gravitational collapse. No? And the classical solution for that is you take magnetic fields, magnetically dominate the star formation, a la Schul Adams Pisano 1987, and then you need underplay fusion to break the flux freezing and more this trickling mechanism to form stars. Or uh, maybe more modern view, or sometimes seen as a competing view, or perhaps sort of a, maybe not the best way to see it because it's probably a combination. Um, Support by turbulence, yeah, supersonic turbulence. And there they argue this just now you have 10 Kelvin of cloud temperature, and you say I have one kilometer per second of uh, uh, velocity dispersion that gives rise to a turbulent pressure that can support my cloud against collapse. Yeah? And essentially what you're saying is star formation is sort of a slow, quasi-steady or quasi-equilibrium process. No? You have a cloud that's sitting there being supported and some that support <coughs> it fails. And since it's since you want to spread this out over a certain time scale, it has to be a relatively slow meaning a process that works over many frequencies. Three mega years at 100 particle per cubic centimeter, approximately. Yeah. So, classical cloud lag times 10, 30, and if you're very classical, 100 mega years. And of course, there was a lot of evidence for this. Um, predictions, decided evidence. Well, people saw starless clouds, right? clouds without stars. They saw large stellar age spreads, which is consistent. They saw the turbulent line widths, and they saw the magnetic fields, strengths and morphologies, hourglass shaped magnetic fields. Yeah? Great. So we have a solution. Well, let's see. Let's go through these, evi these evidences step by step. This is the poster child of a starless 
molecular cloud. We have a layer cloud, we have a four, including CO, that's approximately two million solar masses, there's some other regions up here, and this was always seen as the massive or giant molecular cloud without star formation. Yeah? Unless Tom Gap came along and observed it uh, in 24 micron and CS. In this core here, and you can't see that. I can't see it either. So that's the reason why I'm zooming in here. And what they found is, I think, a total of 49 protostellar cores in the cloud. Yeah? And this is just by example now, yeah? but with Spitzer and North Herschel, it's a common theme. Wherever there weren't any stars or were there stars, clouds before, now we see magnetic objects. Which leads to essentially the statement, all molecular clouds form stars in the local solar neighborhood, I should say, namely, operationally <coughs> we can only do this when we can resolve the protostellar poles. Yeah? So this is sort of limited a little bit to evidence in the galactic neighborhood, but okay. So, second, um, star formation is a process that takes many reform times. No? Here is an H histogram. So Taurus is an example, you can do that for other regions, the Hartman. Um, and what you see is you have the age here, you have the numbers, the bulk of the star formation is between one and two, happens between one and two megabits. Yeah? Of course, admittedly, there's a tail that stretches out to, I don't know, maybe 10 megabits, let's say. Yeah? And now, of course, what you can do is you can bin this logarithmically, as people did. And then you get a distribution, which is here flat, and drops off to 10 megahertz. And you get an H width of 10 megahertz. But that's physically not the right thing to do. The physically right thing, current thing, is to cut a linear, because that's the time scale. Yeah. So, and then you see, yeah, it's between 1 and 2 megahertz. That means that unless there's some conspiracy of the molecular clouds to form stars at the moment we observe them, star formation must set on immediately once the molecular cloud is formed. Okay? It's a very short period of all molecular clouds form stars. Okay. okay. So also it means it's rapid and it's it must be inefficient, however, we, we, we still we have the star formation efficiency graph. And maybe a comment on age spreads. Um, so if you look on the extragalactic literature or various uh, star formation theory papers, often what you read is, age spreads in star formation regions are 10 mega years or something like that. Yeah? Okay, so here's an example. This is Cepheus OB2. Um, there's an um, OB2. Uh, we association in here, um, the bubble is blown by uh, supernovae, H2 regions, winds, and uh, around at the rim, so the projection is here better, sorry, wow, anyway. Um, the association may be 10 million years old, and then um, you have a 4 million old cluster down here, you have 1 million old stars down in these uh, indicated positions, and <coughs> of course, since we that, we can resolve that. If you do this uh, an isogalactic observation, this will be sort of the beam over 50 or 100 parsecs, and the average over all this material. Yeah? That gives you an age spread of 10 megahertz. But the question is, of course, now what is a cloud now here? Yeah? What's a one molecular cloud? Just to point out, so it depends a little bit on what scale is to go and on what you. What's all the stuff you're including in here? Yeah? Um, yeah. um, long lived clouds. So, it's a table summarizing by the 
talk from the home of Venezuela's uh, Paredes, summarizing uh, estimates, age estimates of young stars, and checking whether those regions have associated volatile gas or not. Yeah, sorted according to age. Anything between one and two million years old has volatile gas, anything older, five to ten, let's say, does not. Again, for clouds where we actually can do this exercise, that means for local clouds. Yeah. So there's no way, if you look at that table, that clouds can live 30 million years. Cloud lifetime is somewhere in the here, 5 to 10, depending on which number you want to choose. Yeah? So, if you remember the free fall time, 3 mega years, 100 pounds per cubic centimeter, and I'll get back to that later. Um, it's maybe 1 or 2 free fall times, yeah? but not like 10, as in the classical support. Okay. So the star that clouds have stars, the stars form only briefly, and the mighty clouds are short lived. Which is pretty much contrary to that concept of a cloud support and a slow cross steady process. And so what we try to do is to replace this, take clouds are short lived. Star formation is fast and efficient. <coughs> then we have to explain how that works. And so what we're doing is we're actually going back to what properties do the clouds have to have to allow this to happen. So we're looking back at the cloud formation, which, as it turns out, entails strong fragmentation, which is wrapped in efficient star formation, and then there's a bit of our feedback and magnetic fields, fields which I'll get into later. Um, we decided to address this with uh, this is a non-linear problem, highly time dependent, uh, with uh, numerical simulations, <coughs> like in high dynamics simulations. Okay, so let's go back to the cloud properties. Um, this rapid onset of star formation, of course, imposes a few physical constraints. Yeah? Um, here's our free form time of a uniform density sphere which is, of course, not what the money check cloud is. But for the sake of the naive argument here, or simplistic argument, let's say that works. OK, then you would expect, since this is independent of the radius, you would expect any material that sits at the edge to arrive at the same time at the center as anything that started out, for example. Yeah? So in other words, if you had a cloud like that, you would get one single object in your cloud. Now, if you don't see this, of course, uh, what you see is the star formation and fragmentation and something that's sort of elongated. And the question is, how do you get this? Well, of course, by increasing the local density. Right? And that's sort of obvious. The question is, how do you increase the local density? So if you can get a factor of 10 or 100 in the local density, increase, then I can shorten my free fall time by a factor of 3 or 10, and I comfortably can get local collapse before the whole thing is collapsing. Yeah? So that's sort of the goal. So the question is, how do we do this? Um, it also means that linear density perturbations, so like in a linear instability analysis, do not work, because then we don't have any time scale separation. Yeah, so it has to be a non-linear density perturbation that seeds local collapse, and that's actually what we see. If we don't have 12 CO and 13 CO here, the Goldsmith maps are porous, um, so diffuse gas, and the dense gas actually not only uh, occupies a very small fraction of the area, uh, volume, um, but it's also the smallest fraction of the mass, maybe 10%. Yeah. Um, so somehow nature does that. So in other words, the yeah, linear density perturbations will be set up. And the uh, papers by Bob and Hartman will demonstrate that very nicely. And then we need non-linear density perturbations. Okay. <coughs> so 
Um, how do we get there? How can we see? So of course, what you can do is you can do take your simulation box. You can do the periodic driven turbulence model, supersonic turbulence, um, the post shock density in an isothermal gas scales with the Mach number squared. Yeah, so dynamically. Um, that means that the gene length scales with one over the Mach number. So if I have Mach 10 turbulence, I get a gene length um, um, shrinkage, what's the word? shrinkage of a factor of 10. That means my gene's mass in that region shrinks by a factor of 1,000. Yeah? So then I have my supersonic turbulent fragmentation of the turbulent fragmentation. Wait, wait. The length goes down by factor 10, the density is gone up, right? So your mass doesn't change by factor of Oh yeah, I, so, okay, so. Um, the density goes up, no, it's even worse, yes. I just took the, the length scale. Yes, it's even worse, yeah. No, no, it's not quite as steep. You'll show us where it really happens. Yeah. All right. So the mass goes, the density goes up. Yeah. Huh? And the gene's mass is density times the gene's length of Q. The gene's length is down. No, the gene's mass is, um, so in, in, in the end, the, um, it is one over the square root of rho. Because you have rho, and then you have... Um, the temperature is also changing. Yes, the temperature has also changed. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, now I admit that. So it's just uh, simple. Yeah. It's simple. Yes, yeah, it's just... Um, so that has been, so this gravel turbulent fragmentation has been sort of a, a one way or a possible way to imprint those nonlinear density perturbations or to overcome the global collapse. And the sort of disadvantage with that is, first, you impose the turbulence. So you're not actually looking at the formation of the cloud. Um, and the turbulence is just something you drive in Fourier space. So it's sort of a little bit artificial. Um, and also the problem is um, because of the Fourier driving, you do this in a periodic box. Now, if you remember uh, the James argument, um, that's of course also the linear wave instability problem. It's also an infinite one dimensional argument. Yeah? Um, and once you do the linearization, at some point you get to this point where you have the Poisson equation and you have the perturbation on the density on the right hand side. And that is the point where you throw out the mean density of the gene symbol. Yeah? And so in other words, what you do if you do this in a very box is you cannot see global collapse models because you're throwing out essentially the mean density gas. In other words, I have a periodic box of 10 billion genes masses. And it will be uniform density. I set that up in my computer. The thing would not collapse. Which is sort of weird. If I do this in a finite box, then well, the computer probably will crash because it will try to collapse as quickly as can, whatever, 10 billion genes masses. Um, but so your boundary conditions in other words, the fact that the clouds are finite affects the gravitational energy. So, what we did instead of that is okay, we just said, okay, in the end we want to assemble these clouds. Yeah? So we have an over density of gas, and so what we want to do is we're just saying, okay, we have two flows colliding at a big plane with a simulation box. And you can imagine those two flows at two colliding supernova shells, for example. Yeah? Or sitting in a spiral arm having inflows, or just general turbulent flows, or infall from uh, matter onto the galactic disk. Yeah? It's a fairly general or generic set. And those flows collide with an interface, and you give this interface some perturbation so that you get shear. And this whole thing is in a non-periodic domain for the reason that we want to see 
global gravitational effects. Yeah? And you know, there is uh, physics included in the models, namely uh, thermal effects, heating and cooling, with a uh, dynamic cooling curve, modeling the transition from the warm intermediate to the cold intermediate. There's no state of heat gun, it's hybrid energy models, and it's from our fixed grid simulations. Um, methods later. Um, so, one way to imagine where this could happen, so this is one, and we're looking at this region here, that's uh, in the end of 2007, and so you have know, warm into gas streaming into the gravitational well of the spiral arm. Um, you start seeing the dust lanes and the um, H2 regions here, and then the gas is being compressed, it's cooling, um, and then on the other side, so once the massive stars form, it's being heated and it's dispersing, essentially. No? So that's sort of a sequence of interstellar medium transitions from warm, cold molecular to warm ion Um, so, what does actually do the fragmentation? Um, first, we have a bunch of yeah, high time instabilities. Um, so, we have two shock fronts colliding, and they have some shear, or they have some uh, elevations in their interface. Um, you get essentially a fragmentation instability, non uniform shell instability, vision of 94. Um, so, this is your collision interface, you form a shock layer, gas is streaming in from the left and from the right, um, gas ending up here is being deflected upwards, gas ending up here is being deflected downwards. So, you collect matter here and matter here. So, essentially, you have X momentum transport in the y direction, yeah? And so if you look at the pressures then, you get an overpressure in this region, and you get an under or uh, under pressure, evacuation in this region, um, so you get a pressure imbalance, so this sheet will go, or the perturbations will go, yeah? So that way you can easily fragment a coherent shock. Second one uh, is inherent in this process. Um, one layer is moving on one side is moving up, one side is moving down. So you get shear flow instabilities, gravity hammer instabilities, uh, vorticity generation, meaning turbulence generation. Yeah? So it's a very easy way to generate turbulence. Um, this works best if you have a weak equation of state, and we just saw earlier the transitions from warm nature to cold and then to hot by warm ionized gas. Um, so what we assume in the model is that you have a transition from the warm neutral medium to the, the cold intermediate, the molecular medium, and in that transition um, is a instability, a thermal instability field. Uh, and um, and what that means is, so if you just look at the cooling curve in the instant medium and you calculate your pressure equilibrium and the pressure equilibrium, um, you get an equilibrium pressure curve and the density. Um, you have hot gas that tends to 4 Kelvin, you have cold gas, when it gas to 10 Kelvin, and this is approximately as thermal, this is approximately as thermal as well. And then in between, um, you have a region where your effective adiabatic exponent, the effective gamma, or whatever you want to call it, um, is less than zero, which is sort of a scary proposition thermodynamically. Um, but of course, this is not a closed system, it's why you losses. So much of what it means, once you increase the pressure, um, or once you increase the density, the pressure decreases. In other words, that gas is highly unstable to conversations. Yeah. So once you go into details, 
Um, there's actually condensation mode, and the acoustic mode, and the condensation mode. It's not really a wave mode, but what that does is once you increase the density, um, you drop the pressure, gas is going in. A drop in the pressure increase in the density means that you cool more. So there's a cooling function, heating depending on just the density, and the cooling depending on the density squared, the collision inside the lines. Um, so this is mostly uh, ionizing, um, yeah, ionizing photons, uh, cosmic ray heating, X ray heating, and these are uh, the main culprits for this instability is actually the C2 and 158 micron. Yeah? And so when you can see, once you increase the density, the cooling always wins. Um, it's a local instability because um, it works only as long as the cooling time is as long as the cooling time is longer than the sound crossing time. So it's a condensation mode. So across the region that is unstable, you need to communicate um, the drop in the pressure. And once you get to larger regions, you get a wave mode, which then is fragmentation again. So it's a instability that is extremely strong fragmentation, which is and in increasing the local density, which is exactly what we need. Um, and then of course there's self gravity, things okay. Well let's put that to work and see how that works. So what you now can see this is the setup here. And what I did is, this is how density projection along exactly that view, so seen from the side, so the shells collide from seen from the side. And essentially anything that is blue and green means uh, thermal fragmentation, as I just uh, tried to explain. Um, anything red and yellow is um, local collapse, so gravitational collapse. So here's a red is a yellow cores, so that and then start the stars, which you can't follow in these models, so I can't even talk about star formation, and just can talk about gravitation collapsing object, yeah, to be uh, conservative about this. And um, eventually what you also can see is there's global collapse in the lateral direction. Yeah? So the whole thing is collapsing. Um, which doesn't mean that it doesn't it form stars everywhere. Yeah? So there's not like everywhere you find the yellow uh, regions. Um, so essentially what we already have achieved, and here's the, bar the view essentially down the barrel, what you already have achieved is we get the right sequence. Okay? So we get the sweep up, we get the thermal fragmentation, we get the local fragmentation, the local collapse, before the global collapse, basically. Yeah? And that is just by a combination of thermal instability or strong cooling. I mean, it's really technically, it's not really necessary. It's just it's a sufficient if it's a weak equation of state. And it's a yeah? So no assumption about turbulent driving, etc., etc. We get the turbulent as well. Do the cores end up being a characteristic scale? Or do the cores that are actually under gravitational collapse do they end up being a characteristic scale when you're actually forming, or is, it, is there a large distribution of size? Um, so <coughs> the cores at the point, so um, this is here, so four parasites. So once we collapse, um, the cores keep accreting mass. So once the onset of collapse is probably around um, 10 solar masses or whatever, and that's a resolution issue. You know? So, and you can see that when you have four power power six, but it's a 512, so we can't really look at the fragmentation of the cores, yeah? Um, but, um, since I keep a quick mass, if you look at the mass history, essentially there's no characteristic scale anymore. Um, that self-gravity is important in star formation, it's sort of absolutely obvious. Um, but 
it's also interesting for actually the molecule formation, and let me show that here. Um, this is the same one as we just saw, same setup, but in one case we run it without self gravity, and the other case is run it with self gravity. So that's the view down the barrel again. Yeah? And what we get here is very cool. Um, we didn't do anything uh, regarding chemistry, we just said, okay, above a certain shielding column, I assume there is zero. Yeah, it's just that's true. And okay. yeah. in any case, you will see in the model without self gravity, there is no appreciable CO. In the model with self gravity, you see actually the molecular count. Yeah. So that is sort of already an indication of that um, for the global collapse to start the molecule formation is not that important. It's a, how do we say that? It's a, um, like a signpost that of uh, a thing that you have sufficient column density, but it's more like a coincidence actually that the same column density is um, also column density in which you get gravitational collapse. And that recently have been actually confirmed by models by um, Clark and Glover who uh, did the full chemistry network uh, on such models and saw the same things. Um, so what that happens is um, you have your CO mass rating and then you form the cores. Um, this is just numbers um, and masses added up. Um, and once your CO appears, maybe here, it's only like one or two mega years until you get core formation. Yeah? So your molecular cloud starts maybe right here. Yeah? Before that, there's a molecular cloud because it's all atomic. So that is your rapid onset of star formation. Yeah. Um, you can see that another way. So what this is is the freefall time, the logarithm of the freefall time, against the time in the model. Yeah? Uh, color coded with the mass fraction, of the, actually the mass uh, of the gas at each freefall time bin. Yeah? And the bulk of the cloud sits actually at freefall times between three and five or seven mega years, depending. Yeah? over the whole model. And only once you have your column density of self global self gravity for global collapse, you get uh, the small the density increases, local fragmentation, and you get maybe down here the gravitational collapse, or which would indicate star formation, you know, or the core formation of the model. How does this whole process, how much does it depend on the velocity of the streams relative to each other? Um, so and these are basically the fixed room function. Yes. Given by microphysics. Right. But so then you can change the post shock temperature of the gas strongly relative to those fixed rooms. Yeah. So, so we played around with that. So, um, so these are models um, which, um, where the effective Mach number at the collision is uh, something like two. We went up to Mach ten, and you see more fragmentation, but the cooling times are so short that the cooling always wins. So, it's. So qualitatively, it doesn't change. Uh, in the quantity, it changes somewhat because you get more fragmentation once you have the higher shocks. Uh, but also, higher shocks means higher compression. The way you get the dioxide of atomic gas, and, and then it's what's the pre-shock temperature? The pre-shock temperature in these ones, so we, those started at three particles per cubic centimeter. The pre-shock temperature of uh, three thousand. And so, um, I mean, various groups have done various versions of this. Uh, you use different cooling curves, you have. Uh, so, my 10 gives you up to 10 to 5 is like that. 
Yeah, uh, and that's very extreme back ten uh, at three thousand. Yeah, so that's why we keep actually to the lower amount. Of emission, no? um, okay, so what you can see then here is thermal fragmentation is small filling factors, short three four times, increase in the local collapse. And it's only of course in these regions that more stars, but the envelope, which is the good new stuff here, the accused gas, has really never taken place. Not uh, taken taken part. Well, gravitation clock is not taking place. Uh, well, this is not participating in the actual star formation. Yeah? Which is what we want. Yeah? So we want to keep the bulk of the gas out of the star formation. Sorry, but yeah. I just want to say the time scale. It takes 10 million years before anything happens. Yes. Right, so that's the time scale for this thermal instability growing to very non-linear region, or was that time scale? That's pretty, pretty much the three-four time, right? Um, so the three-four time, um, so three-four time here, that is one mega year, and then here is ten here. This is um, so essentially what? just to, yeah, the sweep up time. Until, so the idea is, um, well, you have to wind your cloud, and it's an over density in the gas, so you have to sweep up the gas somehow. And if you start with a background gas tends to be in this case, 3 parts per centimeter, and then some flow velocity, then it takes approximately 10 minutes to speed up the gas until you have a column density where you could form CO. But that's also the critical time for cloud in general, so why didn't the cloud collapse? Um, this is just the density, it's not the gene, so the gene's uh, mass doesn't enter here. So I'm not saying anything about the temperature in this plot, but the temperature is at uh, whatever, uh, 300, whatever Kelvin is, yeah? It's also, um, so this, in that sense, thanks for the question because um, I should explain this. It's not necessarily coherent. This. this is just essentially a histogram. So that could be lots of little pockets of gas and not like one big blob. And then each of the little pockets could, well be, could be well below one gene's mass, and so it wouldn't collapse. Huh? Yeah, like that. But you also be starting at a finite time, but the spiral density way the galaxy lasts more than 10 million years. Yes. Right. So, I mean, it has to start somewhere, <coughs> but in fact, in fact, this is a propagating structure. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so this is, I mean, in a way, this time scale is due to the numerical setup, to the experiment setup. It's not in the gross time scale. It's, it's, a, it's a transient, it's a, it's a numerical transient. It's a numerical transient in a way, um, unless you say, okay, um, I, if I have um, super supernova shells colliding or whatever, yeah, it gives you an idea how much time do I need to collect the material. It's actually shorter than the simple 1D argument. Uh, because the decisive part here is that you reach a certain column density. And that has been always this criticism on the model that it takes too long to assemble the gas. But the 1D argument forgets about the second and third dimension, and what actually happens if, if you have um, this in a, in additional dimensions, is you have a flow, and once you have a certain column density, the whole thing can collapse naturally. And that increases your column density by a factor of 10 essentially within a very short time. Yeah. So um, it's not, it's shorter than the just the linear ascending yeah. And as to um, the spiral density waves, um, so I think when the movie and the that um, this, so Kim and Ostriker and collaborators, they see that in their models uh, very detailed and they describe this in great detail. So this is your cross section through your spiral arm. Yeah? So this is your spiral arm and take a cross section like this. And I look at the gas, I don't know, outside co-rotation, inside co-rotation, I don't know now. It does maybe something like this. So I just look at the gas flow across this um, cross section, along this cross section. Yeah? So the gas is moving in here. And so I have certain uh, 
this kind here. And so once the gas see, starts to see the gravitation potential, it's going to be focused into that gravitational potential. Yeah? And what then happens, as Kim and Oz tried to show, um, you get a shock. And that shock is not stable. Yeah? So the shock is moving back and forth across this region. So that means that these flows here sometimes collide here, sometimes they collide here. Um, and you form electric clouds, but it's a transient position. So that you don't form the electric clouds always at the same place. Yeah, so it's moving back and forth, this focusing point. And so in that way, you have a transient uh, uh, flow convergence, which sort of comes up here. Yeah, so that's a validity foundation. One could say, OK, this is not completely right. Um, oh yeah, one thing that comes out of this is, of course, once the free fall time of a cloud, I am take, 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 depending on what density you want to choose. Yeah. Um, and that is actually an issue once you start thinking about uh, yeah, stuff in which you relates to the free fall time or whatever, because you always make an average here. And um, depending on what you use here, the time scale is not too long, too short, or short. So let me just quickly summarize this part and then try it again. Um, so, even this doesn't work, so we need this fragmentation, and we can do with these models with the speed of gas and that of the fragmentation. Then I can confirm its abilities, so that works. Uh, we get a free fall time, so we get a global collapse, we get a global collapse, and so we get only a tiny fraction of the mass actually turned into gravitational collapsing objects. Um, so as long as this is uh, so the thermal effect or one from any strong radiant losses this actually works, it doesn't rely on the flexibility. Um, so, in the end, I'm going to briefly just talk about two things here. Um, this always this term, the equilibrium hovering around the large and micro clouds. Um, first, technically, it's not an equilibrium, but it's an equilibrium partition, it's an energy partition. And once you do a particular factor of velocities, the free fall velocity is only a factor of square root of two different from Area velocity, so whether the cloud is free from the free fall collapse or it's an aerial equipetition, or energy equipetition, it's maybe not quite that clearly distinguished as the velocities at least. And so if you like the models, what you can do is you can plot your um, area parameter depending on what gas you include, anything larger than 100 parts to the centimeter, anything larger than 10,000 parts to the centimeter, these are these different lines. And you see, first the thing is evolving, of course, over time. So whenever you look at the cloud, you get a different answer. And also it depends on the density range, which, once you think about it, of course, makes sense. Yeah? But, um, so, realization is sort of a Actually, concept in this context. Um, of course, you can average over time. Uh, you can average over many clouds, but then you don't say anything about one thing. Um, and global gravity is on our rules. And keeps creating mass, which comes back, which I come back to in a second. Um, the turbulence is a consequence of the cloud formation. It's not something that is sort of, an, it's not really an agent, it's a consequence of dynamical thermodynamics. Uh, yes, yeah, I think that's really good. You're saying something about the clouds of heat mass, but the simulations you have just mass, and this is just uh, compressed by questions. Is this, uh, you actually you get um, a creation of mass um, also uh, laterally, so that is not just due to the flow collision. So at the very late stages, um, the problem is at that point we have to stop the models because 
the information about the gravitational collapse has traveled to the boundaries. And then it gets undefined because we would have to make up information flowing into the box. Yeah? But we see, we definitely see accretion onto the cloud, not just from the uh, flows. I have a feeling it was just more or less compression. Yeah, yeah initially it's just compression. Initially, but initially you don't really have a cloud yet. Yeah. So um, once the thing, sorry. So this was the other thing I had, that not if clouds are just uh, swept of mass, which has been then compressed by two or three whatever. Yeah, that's the basic idea. Yeah, that's a, that's the idea. They're transient. They're not well-defined objects in yeah, in space and time, so to speak. Yeah, so it's, it's a matter identity. Um, they're marking bottles of potential wells, like spiral arms, or whatever. But they're not um, identities or well-defined structures that live or have well-defined boundaries living over a hundred million years. Or so that's the transit. Well, anyway, so um, you can see can, uh, essentially energy budget, gravitational energy is driving the kinetic energy, meaning the is driven by the gravity here. Okay? We have, of course, the onset of kinetic energy here, which is due to the inflow of the compression initially. So anything that's tur any turbulence motions just a consonant of the formation of the lower balance. Let me skip this. Um, let me skip that too. Um, what happened now? Like that. Um, well, very briefly, so what you then form is essentially filaments. Filaments right now are very popular. Uh, um, and we can try it. 1979, this is an optical, now commercial, everything is a filament. Um, and so, why is that? Yeah. So, well, if you just play the game of gravitational collapse, and just assume pressureless gravitational collapse, yeah, many genes mass. It's not quite right, but let's give it a sphere, you have a global free fall time and a local free fall time, blue, global, red, local. And find a ratio by which the local free fall time is faster than the global time. So this is work by Andy Horn and collaborators. Um, and so you can do this for a sphere, you can do this for a two dimensional sheet, and you can do this for a one dimensional filter. Okay? And what you essentially see is the further you reduce the dimension, the easier it gets to collapse slowly. Yeah? Um, remember, this is essentially the argument we had earlier saying you need highly nonlinear density perturbations for the global collapse to win. Yeah? This becomes less and less of an issue once you go down to filaments. Which is why you see is local fragmentation or local fragmentation in filaments. Because it's actually naturally the easiest way. Yeah? So a global, global collapse can win over global collapse. Um, and Gravity effect makes things round, it's only of true, of course, if you have an isotropic pressure to counter. And so now the reverse filaments suggest, and these massive filaments suggest that you have a pressureless collapse. Okay. And um, with that, uh, let me just summarize this. Okay, so this is the point I'm trying to make here. So the molecular clouds are finite, gravity is a long range force, none of that's low gravity rules, and it's a natural consequence. The star formation efficiency is set by the rapid fragmentation and the transformation, and the diffuse cloud envelope is not contributing to the star formation violation. We can play around with the feeds there. Clouds are dynamic, not in equilibrium. Turbulence is driven by gravity. Turbulence of course, I skipped over this is a inappropriate concept in the context of magic clouds unless you have local FEMA, unless you have outflow sources, H2 regions, and average over a large enough 
but just turbulence by itself, supersonic turbulence, and that medium leads to fragmentation. And the bulk of the energy is on the larger scale, so that means you compress very disruptive job, but it's not an isotropic pressure that supports it. Um, and that's it over this. Thank you. Can you make the limits to airport? Yes. Where is it? There it is. Come on. Is it gone? Yeah, now you can okay. see it. Yeah. Yes, you can. I sort of skip over that a little bit. You see a filament, and you see actually the gravitation collapse at the kinks or at the ends of the filament, which is exactly what you would expect just from the gravitation. And is the formation of the filament more or less coincident with the, the local gravitational collapse? Yes. It's, um, so you Actually, don't get densities high enough to form a star until you just about form the ball. Um, you have something down here. But the yes. red stuff is really appearing just as you're forming the ball. Yes, that is correct. So essentially it's, I mean it's sort of also a time resolution issue, but um, once you have the filament, things go very quickly. And since you have the seeding of the nonlinear density equation is very early on, the, um, um, the appearance of the cores is nearly concurrent with the filament. And the so, in some cases, you can imagine you have sheets forming first and then you bring in long sheets of filament, or you bypass that first stage. In a way, you could think of this as a sheet formation. It's actually a finite sheet. So we did the exercise and look at the gravitation accelerations. And they essentially what you get, you get nearly a ring that's a little bit open here. But you get a peak of the gravitation accelerations just out of the of that mass distribution. Which is, if you, so if you do an exercise of taking the gravitation acceler accelerations in a finite three-dimensional sheet, Formally, the accelerations are actually go to infinity. Um, now, of course, it's sort of expanded in the third dimension, but you still have that global gravitation geometry effect, um, which plays a role in forming that filament. Because in the Colorado universe, as I'm sure you've looked into, I mean, you know, first, because the first caustic features to form are, 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 are pancakes, but you never really go through a pancake phase with Gaussian perturbations. The first really prominent nonlinear features form in the site of local light. So if you look like halos, high sigma halos are the filaments. Yeah, um, I mean, yes. uh, let, let me show you something. Here's the here's sort of so, bad part, which I <laughs> glanced over a little bit. Um, yes, it's a filament. Uh, where's my filament? So you just saw the movie, right? That is this guy here. And you can see, um, so it's a sort of gray scale. Let me see that there. Um, it's actually what you would see in CO. So we did sort of a crude line transfer here. And now here's a one yellow core, here's another yellow core, here's another yellow core, and here's a red core. Yeah? So that's a three dimensional data cube. Now you look from the other side, and you're welcome to identify this film. It's actually pretty interesting. And it's gone. Oh, I mean, there are other filaments, but it's not really clear that you, you don't see something like from the side, like a round blob or anything. Yeah? So it's a little bit more complicated, but if you look at the accelerations, you still get like a global gravitational mode. And that there. Yeah. Um, by the way, you also can see that this that filament is equating mass, which is just the transversal velocity and um, essentially the sediment accretes its own mass. So it's sort of like a gene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a little 
more complicated ones in your country. Once you have the chance to rotate the thing. So I am wondering whether the filaments have any correlation with the magnetic field relation. There are some observations showing that the magnetic fields are actually injected along the filaments. Um, yeah, so we find, we find both. And it seems to be like 50 50. And we haven't done the exercise yet, but that's the next step to say, okay, we classify the filaments in accreting or gravitationally unstable, as far as I can just have said, and in like fused transient filaments. And is there a difference? That, that would be an interesting thing to do. We haven't done this yet, but that's on, on our mind. Yeah, absolutely. That's sort of the uh, thing about magnetic fields. Why is the fuse structure? Thank you.